I think we're going to war for real. I'll tell you one little story that I probably have never told anybody before. We got hit with a NVA sapper company supported by infantry. It's not easy and you know, that one was tough, but fortunately it worked out for us. Welcome to War Stories, conversational military history. What's going on, everyone? Preston Stewart and Sayer Payne. More stories joined today from Ukraine by Justin Roberts. So thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely, man. So, uh, Justin, you did some work on No Greater Love, which was a documentary. I, I don't know, if Sayer, if you've seen it. I definitely shared it with family members because it was um, kind of the time frame that we were in and around Afghanistan. So it told mm -hmm. some of that story. And there aren't that, I, in my opinion, there's not that many good stories from Afghanistan that kind of show what it was like. Um, and now you're out there doing something new, doing something different. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I, I, I told the wife, like I, I, I've done war films. I've done stuff in disaster zones. I, I really need to get into like vacation filming or something, something else other than war. Yeah. yeah. But no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, like the the sleeping habits of beach goers do a documentary about that. Um, but no, so I you know I did No Greater Love uh, in 2010, and the situation. My second master's is in media arts and communication, uh, with a focus in writing, screenwriting, and so I've always had passion and love for film. But um, you know, chaplains. I was a military chaplain. Uh, chaplains are not allowed to carry weapons, and so I asked my commander if i could carry a camera and he said sure just don't get shot and so i i went on the missions uh went with i went out with each platoon at least once on a mission and that wasn't to do the film stuff that was just as a chaplain because if you don't go out they don't talk so you need to be near the front dealing with some of the same stuff and and really that there was a ministry strategy to that honestly like the in 2009 this battalion was the most suicidal battalion in the military uh, we had a suicide my first day on the job uh, another week later then another and another and we had a suicidal ideation every single week for the first six months this is so, in country justin or like just back at home in country uh, and what battalion who are we talking about here uh second 327th uh no slack okay uh first awesome. brigade yeah yeah so this was a hurting battalion they had been through so much combat so many heavy rotations they were done they were burnt out so uh the ministry strategy was get connected um get into everybody's cell phone like you know make sure that they have me on speed dial uh know them by name and so that way whenever a problem happens you're there they they do think to call you mm -hmm. and one of the best ways to earn the right to be spoken to on heavy issues is to be in combat with them so mm -hmm. that was why i did that and uh but since i also i didn't have a weapon i happen to also have a camera while going around doing that that's how the film got put together and so we did the documentary and um uh screen that for white house congress uh, festivals released it out theatrically and then it's now on amazon prime that's kind of cool because you weren't you weren't a documentarian um i was hoping you'd, you'd talk about how you did it uh you were a soldier you were deploying you just happened to i was a uh, camera i know how to do both i you know it's it's weird because like they you ever like meet one of those dudes that the guy's a really good soldier really squared away but he's also like a poet <laughs> The like, best, yeah. That's the yeah, essence. Like, yeah, I that feel like we get a lot of that yeah. stuff. You, it, there's another world to these people, and what happens oh, is yeah. people in mindset they see you as this thing. So it's really hard to imagine, for them to imagine that you also can be really good at this other thing. Like one of my buddies who's now in cybersecurity is a vice president of a company in cybersecurity. He was an infantryman, a knuckle dragger. I was like, man, I didn't realize you're so smart. <laughs> Yeah. But he he was and uh and he is, and so yeah, that's film has always been my passion and, and mm -hmm. putting those things together. Um, but um, uh, I also love being a chaplain and taking care of people. I mean, I that's, that's I love being that person, you know. 
and just put those two together. That's really how I have approached film even to this day. You know, it's not just trying to tell a story. It's also trying, how can you use this story to make a difference, to actually have a functional impact on uh, people's lives? Something that has been really cool with this podcast, and it's, I'm, I'm certain, a fraction of the impact your film has had, but we've, we've come across people who have shared others' stories to say, hey, mom, dad, son, daughter, whatever, this is similar to what I went through because they maybe don't have the vocabulary or the ability to articulate yes. that experience. And I did it with your film. So I'm sure people did it all the time. That's so cool. The guys that can't, for whatever reason, even if they want to share what it was like, um, that still has an impact today. That's, that's really cool. I think, I think that's, that's why this kind of media is so important because like the more conversations that get out there, um, it does create empathy and understanding. And I think like, especially like with these podcasts though too, it's because it's an ongoing conversation that can, you know, for a film every couple of years, we're able to produce it and push it out sure. with. So that means like whenever there's something currently going on, I have, I have drag time. It's going to take me a while to get that out where I cast immediately kind of start those conversations and create uh, a collective understanding on what we're immediately facing. So I think it's interesting. Yeah. It helps. I mean, cause you know, we talk about it a lot, or at least I do the whole disconnect, the 1% thing. And, and I don't think that's on purpose. It's not like we do that to necessarily be ostracized from society and not relate to them. It's just sort of a side effect of this very special microcosm sort of universe slash way of life. And the unintended consequences, they just, especially the era we're talking about. It's just that turn and burn, going to Iraq for 12, taking time off, going to yeah. Iraq again, taking time off, going to Afghanistan this time, taking time off. And now they're going to, you know, Poland and other places where they're just, they're just yeah. used and nobody necessarily knows that, I don't think. And, but these are all Americans, right? Doing American yeah. missions. And um, whether it's from a moral standpoint that these are, you know, fellow American humans or just, even a financial standpoint, these are taxpayer dollars, right? Being yeah. used. And uh, yeah. just the awareness, like what Preston was saying, Restrepo came out when we were deployed. Well, probably same time you guys were, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it so dropped on younger, Netflix. Yeah. And I just remember uh -huh. other family and friends like, oh, and by the way, we were in the South. It wasn't like what we were doing at all. Like from a enemy engagement, mission, the terrain, yeah. a lot different, but it still was kind of like, Oh, it's not just because every I feel like everybody wants to believe at least or tell themselves that we're out there handing out candy to children and yeah. to build wells, you know, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. a part of it. But you can't do that until you've established so, security. And how do you establish yes. security? It's by doing some pretty violent things to other people. Yes. Yeah. You got to create that space for progress to be made. And uh, uh, Corngall Valley was like between like we're about three clicks, I think five clicks. Oh, yeah. uh, it was like Pakistan, us, Cornwall Valley in that same AO. And so it was Kunar province and it was just very kinetic. Whereas mm -hmm. like, I know like down South, like Helmand, I mean, like the, the casualties were, were massive from IEDs. And in a lot of ways, like I preferred the kinetic, even though there's a lot of casualties, like it's, I don't know. It's like in my head, I was like, I'd much rather be shot than blown up. Um, well, yeah. and I was like, I'd much rather be here walking around with flat land than being a fishbowl getting <laughs> overrun and masked upon <laughs> that you guys had to yeah. experience, you know, on these sort yeah. of narrow roads that you fall off the cliff and die in your Humvee like, or whatever. Pick your poison, but you have to pick a poison. Yeah, yeah. exactly. A weird kind of situation to be in. It's like, well, I, I don't really have a choice. At first, we were supposed to go uh, south to one of the places where a lot of IEDs. And I was like, well, dang, you know, here we go. And uh, then they moved us up to Kunar and then they're like, well, it's not IEDs, you know? <laughs> so you don't have that as much. There will be some, but not as much. And I was like, well, okay, you know, but it is weird thought processes that you have whenever you're faced with those situations. It's like, well, uh, you, you, you create a preference for awfulness. It's like, like you got to sell it, but you can't really sell it. Yeah. I mean, you got to have this feeling. I feel like, like, well, like I read like Matterhorn while I was over there, which is just about the yeah. misery of being a Vietnam platoon leader in the Marines. And like, 
you're, or, you're or just like thinking about Band of Brothers cereal. and Bastogne when I'm cold. Like at least <laughs> it's not as bad as what they had. Or like, let yeah. me think about the Pacific. Or, you know, funny. I just try to tell myself this is bad, but you know what? It's not what they had to go through. You know, we can do this sort of thing just to tell yeah. yourself it's one foot in front of the other, really, day by day sort That's, of environment. Yeah, I was like watching cartoons and stuff, just trying to find something to laugh at. I can't imagine yeah. reading like hardcore stuff. That's funny yeah. though how people process it. Like, because uh, yeah, if you do find somebody who has, I call them anchors, uh, people who I've met who have endured suffering well. And those are like my anchors in reality, like that I go back to whenever I'm dealing with something like, well, I need to, you know, the way that they've handled it, I'm like, okay, I can, I can push on, you know, I'll be okay. You know, um, I've got one, one of my friends who's just a rock star, Al Kovac. He is a uh, former president of Paralyzed Veterans of America. And uh, all the stuff the guy's gone through, just incredible, tough, but the most incredible, at, former Navy SEAL, just high speed dude, you know, um, but has the kind of drive character and um, uh, resilience that I want. I want to be like that. So it's like he has become one of those anchor mentors for me like when I got out. And also one of the guys who helped me out with like a lot of my mental stuff whenever I got out of the military. You know, I was just going through depression and things like that. And mm -hmm. I could call that dude. And you know, he had a lot of good advice. It's important. What's your, yeah. um, what's your thought on the anchor? You know, if, if, you know, you've been through an experience where your anchor worked for some the worst yeah. of the worst, let's say that a human has to face, but then later, let's say 10 years later now, right. Um, mm -hmm. things like bills or arguments with your spouse, like a uh, job, what do I do for a living? You know, these sort of little things that come up in life that are also things. stressful, knowing you have yeah. this anchor in the past that has worked, but yeah. Now you feel like you're floating in the middle of nowhere with no life jacket or anything. You're like, what the heck's going on, man? I, I, I you know, I had this sort of experience, but what, yeah. how can I not process these little, what we perceive as little things going on today? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, man. Like the, I've always been blessed with, um, finding really good people who've helped me, you know, I, uh, just finding people who are kind of like point men, you know, that person who's out in the front kind of helping find the path. And I've always had like, you know, uh, either a mentor or um, a guide a, a lot of my life, honestly, like who's helped me out and kind of pointed me in some good directions or has given good advice. Uh, so I don't know, but I do think that I seek that out though, too. Like people that I gravitate towards who, the reason that I liked Al is because Al loves soldiers. Like the way that he went about when he was in Paralyzed Veterans of America, he didn't care about the politics. He didn't care about all this other stuff. Take care of veterans. We just, we, we build our life. We take care of veterans. And I, I, I saw the behind the scenes kind of stuff that he had to go through to keep that true north. And I respected that so much. I was like, I want to be like that dude. You know, I want to, I want to kind of go in that, that, that approach. And so professionally and, and also just like ministry, but I don't mean that in the religious connotation. I mean, like just taking care of people. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be, you know, kind of going in that direction. And, but then I had the added benefit of also getting a good mentor and a friend. And so I still work with the dude. He still puts up with me. I love you know? it. But yeah. Yeah. So, so the, what, I was going to say what, I want to transition to where you're at today and what you're doing today. Um, were you, looking for a new project um were you no yeah i've, I've been a, a um a short like I'll, I'll give like the the um fire hydrant like right after no longer to love went through pretty tough depression kind of spiraled down for a little bit. uh was working on some projects um i put together a racing documentary with some guys from SEAL Team 6, Special Forces, Marine Recon, in the Baja 1000 race. So went out there, got a big film crew. We filmed the race. It was awesome. 
And, yeah. but really that was focused on, for the interviews, focused on how do you come home from war? You're lead sniper for SEAL Team 6. You get out of the military, who are you now? And that's an mm -hmm. issue of identity. So put together that project on the production side, but then COVID hit and finances dried up. Hmm. <laughs> so I was like, dang. So, um, and then uh, shortly after that, my wife got cancer, uh, nodular melanoma, the stage 3C. So she's been kind of my, my, my rock. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to go through that. She's good. She, she survived. She's a trooper. It's just awesome. I mean, she's braver than I am. I guarantee you much rather go back to combat than deal with that, hmm. you know, um, yeah. any day. Right. So got through that. So that kind of put my career on pause for a bit going through some of those things. And then shortly after that home got knocked over by hurricane Laura. Oh, uh, destroyed geez. my home and then hurricane delta <laughs> so i was like man um i didn't of all the biblical characters i didn't want to be job but i was starting to like that and uh so uh i grabbed a film crew i just started building my film crew out of people in the community who were left and that that was a place without electricity for three weeks without water for four weeks um it was Third world country devastation was massive and people didn't see it because it was only in the news for a day right and so it was the yeah. weirdest thing yeah it just like hey there's a storm and then trump said something and then everybody was gone you know and so uh but we put three episodes together on that and the whole goal was put the episodes together then donate the monetization of views to the charities that we're covering and that's when the concept of do good was born I partnered with one of my buddies who's a former 82nd Airborne medic and a uh, lead singer for a rock band called Three Beards named Hank like Barb. It. And right. he's just an awesome dude. So he came out and he's just been my best friend for a number of years. I've been shooting music videos for him. Yeah. And then uh, we put the series together. But then as we were launching that um, and working it towards syndication, uh, then Ukraine war broke out. And um, I had a buddy who is former special forces who was out here rescuing kids from orphanages. And I was sitting holding my daughter one night thinking about it. And I was like, damn, like, you know, she's safe here with her mom, with my wife, you know, um, but there's those kids that aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I called Hank and I was like, we got to do something. I don't know what we're going to do, but we got to do something. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go do a documentary on the war effort so we can articulate. I've done that before. I know how to do that. And um, then we'll do 20 episodes, uh, do good, covering the humanitarian efforts. Then I uh, reached out to my friend Karen over at Veterans and Media and Entertainment. Uh, she produced for Discovery for like 10 years. She's a um, former Army officer incredible incredible human being uh, she was out rescuing she was leading operations rescuing people out of afghanistan after the pullout and so she awesome. was busy doing that and then once she was able to finally pull away from that then she was able to jump on board with this and then yeah then we came out here and started feeling. so that's 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 a fire hydrant talk hopefully that yeah that's crazy that's a lot yeah. of stuff in a short yeah, period of yeah. time so how long yeah. have you been there now? A couple months? Um, six weeks. Six weeks? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm just now, like I'm in Lviv uh, at an Airbnb in a grandma's old apartment. I can tell it's decorated in here is like a grandma would decorate. Um, but I got the paint Lviv color in, yeah. <laughs> little doilies everywhere. But uh, yeah, so we kicked out here um we went along all the front and just partnered with the ukraine military uh to start covering the stories and so these guys were just incredible giving us access um letting us move through checkpoints doing whatever we wanted to do because essentially they saw no greater love and they were like yeah we want to do something like that and that kind of allowed the doors to open for really good access that other reporters just weren't getting and um, so we went to the front to Kharkiv um, in the gray zone, went a little too close because the uh, we kicked up the drone and then 
they had such good response time. Like their counter was so fast. And so we were, uh, we kicked up our drone and then I heard another drone and I was like, crap, we gotta go. And so we got into the van, booked it, and then uh, mortar fire started coming in in that position. And so you learned, I mean, you just, you have to have a fast response. If you think you're in danger, you gotta go. You just gotta keep moving. Cause it's not a matter of uh, sm like small arms, you, like, you take cover. There's no real cover. You can get in trenches and hope, but uh, grid squares are deleted. You know? That's so what, you oh, not, interesting. You better not be in that grid square. So <sighs> we, Kharkiv, Gray Zone, um, Donbass, uh, or no, south of Kharkiv, uh, that area that before the bulge, uh, before Russia did that that heavy push, mm -hmm. um, so we were in that area, kind of the top of where that bulge was forming. Izium, kind, of, kind of that area, or down yes. further south? Yeah, it's Izium. Um, and it's like in that area. Sure. I'm horrible. I'm a chaplain, so I'm horrible at geography. But the uh, so we covered some of the infantry there but the like infantry is just it's a type of fight this is our artillery fight so the infantry are kind of just hanging and chilling uh and the artillery are the ones that are doing you know heavy labor there's a good article in war in the rocks uh, that posted about where it was a retired colonel that said would we do any better and it was it was it was trans it was switching the u.s with russia saying russia is making a lot of mistakes but would the u.s do any better but it's interesting looking at both sides of the conflict because to your point there's a reason they're doing what they're doing and yeah. it doesn't, it's not, this is not Afghanistan. Um, this is yeah. maybe pieces of Iraq in 03, but not for long. Um, yeah. So it's really hard to, there's, there's so many things that I think your experience probably helps with um, maybe calm under fire or the ability to talk others down um, who are getting a little nervous at times or, or just the bravery <laughs> moving forward. Right. But um, yeah, getting across no man's land. Come on. We didn't do that. Yeah, that's hard. It's it's like the, it feels like a math problem. You just, you feel like you wish you could figure it out. Like, and when you're sitting there and, and like looking through the telescope, you're like, you, you, your mind does go there. Like, well, and then you start kind of like eyeing, well, what resources do they have in this local area? Well, they got like 12 guys here. Uh, and they probably have these, you know, spread out across a massive line. So they don't have the human personnel um and there it's peer on peer equipment so you know they they can let the russians keep coming and keep you know dropping bodies if they play it defensively and they're going to get more gains that way because the russians actually have to push and ukraine can through a war of attrition wait for good weapons to come up and then they can just start knocking them out bleed so, them dry yeah. yeah so it's like they're playing it smart and it's like i'm not being critical but there is like that thing in my brain that you know, we, we want to aggress, um, but it's not the smartest move right now with the uh, the resources, supplies, manpower that they have. Um, and and I do think that they are getting quite a few kills, like going about it that the way they are. Um, and the thing is, too, it's like when the ones that I've talked with, too, they are super smart. Some of them have been at this since 2014. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. At least when it comes to the Russians, and uh, I am curious though, like what kind of perspectives would be different if American commanders, officers, leadership, had, you know, is a part of this equation too? How would we approach it differently? It is a good question. There's so we, much uh... confusion um, on the ground with what's happening, where it's happening, the progress, all of that. I think it's June 8th mm -hmm. right now. I think in the last 72 hours, Severodonetsk has been held um, by everybody for periods of time and i can't yes. you know there's an attack there's a counterattack. there's like so when you're yeah. out there are, are you are you telling individual stories are you trying to get after like the individual experience so you can avoid that messiness of the lines i you know it's like a my, my approach is always kind of get where it's the worst and then look around see who the heroes are and then tell those stories. And um, so that's the way we've been approaching it. It has, I've been trying to chase small arms, uh, which has been hard. Like when I first came over here, I think I was coming over here with still kind of an Afghanistan mindset that I was going to get small arms. 
those and had that. Like, I would show them the truck for no good love, and they're just like, we're not doing that. No, it's it's artillery. And I'll oh, okay, I'll go somewhere else, and I'll, I'll find small arms. And no, <laughs> it's the same thing. And then it's like, and then I'd leave a place for like, oh yeah, those guys, they, they actually just pushed forward. It's like, damn it. So um, it's, it is a, a completely different style of fighting. Uh, I think probably closer to World War I, it, but with up technology. Um, and so like my strategy is now kind of pivoted to, um, I've covered all those stories, went up along Kharkiv, Donbass, uh, make alive, and then um, back to Dnipro to cover the wounded who are coming in at the hospital and also to cover the uh, the children who are wounded. Um, and so they gave us free access to film, the surgeries, the severe stuff, because I want to show the consequences of this war and uh, the, the, the human cost. And so um, we're going to be down for a month because I have to write the thing and then go back for uh, we're, I don't want to kind of say exactly everything that we're going to be doing, but it's going to be essentially inserting with some units that we know now mm -hmm. um, that we got more familiar with because you do want to be with uh, professional okay. soldiers, like really squared away dudes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, scout sniper teams is a little bit easier because you know that you're going to get into those small arms engagements in. So uh, just rolling that way. And, that's uh, what I was wondering. That's interesting you mentioned that because I feel like this would be ripe for like the what we call the SKTs, the small kill teams. Yeah. And yeah. Um, seeing if, you know, those are getting pushed out. But they you are. mentioned, a, yeah. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned a good point though with the no small arms because that is what we faced. And you started talking about the drone counter drone, and that's what scares the crap out of me. I think that is the future of war. And I wonder if our yeah. era was the last of the human being versus human being behind sort of a weapon looking at each other. And yeah. now, cause I mean, even the Taliban have uh, UAVs right now. And so like, yeah. when, like when we were there, they didn't, it was one-sided, but now you're in an experience where it's both, you know, both sides now have it. And that's going to mm -hmm. become uh, more normal. Even the, like when the Taliban took over Kabul, a part of that, that blitzkrieg that they did, they assassinated a key leader in Mazari Sharif with, Former yep. ANA guys that were trained by the U.S. and they and they rigged up a um, their own drone to sort of drop its own homemade bomb, and that's how they assassinated him. So it's like they're using it. Obviously, the Russian is a completely conventional force, yes. but 10, 20, 30 years from now, this is like Terminator stuff, is what I'm picturing, and that scares the crap out of me. Yeah, that that is a horrifying thing. That, you know, empathy is lost with distance. Mm. And there's nothing more distant than just pressing a button from a screen and then people being deleted and it is you know like with these rocket systems it is like if that's it that way like i mean just massive amount of territory just gone and so the casualties are so high on both sides because of that but it's a weird feeling like when you're sitting in the trenches and the bullets aren't flying but then you start hearing the artillery and stuff like you know what's happening and you know, a hundred yards over there. Um, it, it's, it's so it's, yeah, I was trying to figure out like how to describe this, like the, the feeling, uh, the feeling between small arms and, you know, long range. Like I was trying to figure out like how to really contextualize it. And the only thing that really kind of wrapped in my brain is like, it feels like the difference between poker and roulette, you know, poker, you can kind of play your hand, you can kind of get low, you, you know, you, there's luck but there's chance but you can play it whereas roulette it's you hope they didn't they didn't find you you hope they didn't have good coordinates and you hope they're not doing a good job um but if they are and they get it in the pocket then you're done and yeah. there's not a lot you can do it now like advancing it with drones and things like that that's that is horrifying and i was i was talking with some friends like where we're out here i was like trying to like how do we breach how could we take you have those trenches 200 meters away. And I was like, well, if, if they're knocking down drones, I mean, what if we just got some RC cars and put a camera on it, put some C4 or something and just drive them straight over, which sounds so silly, but would work. And if you do it in mass and there's the technology is there. Oh yeah. And how do you defend against that? 
like 20 RC cars coming at you. Um, and there's and the Russians, I think, are kind of like we are, where it's like just scattered lines with a few people kind of post guard. Um, but I don't think the Russians have been super professional. So their guards would be overwhelmed. And it's, it's things like that, like this new kind of creativity that can play with the technology that's here. And the innovations are going to be happening in the trenches. Just like I saw in Afghanistan. I mean, there's innovations that are being made during wartime. Mm -hmm. and those innovations are going to be happening here. Right. Um, there was, I had, a, I'll be very short with the story. Um, one of my snipers in Afghanistan, he was a former bodyguard for Kid Rock and Eminem. Um, he learned how to triangulate from that bodyguard time, uh, how to triangulate the locations of the uh, paparazzi based off of the paparazzis would use radios. So they figured out how to triangulate those radios using their systems. Well, over to Afghanistan, they had like the wolfhound systems. Yep. Well, he three wolfhound systems together and had them triangulate exact coordinates and then would launch a, a missile on that coordinate. And we were getting like so many kills from doing that. And the, the second day they said that they were Taliban on some level, PID, uh, positively identify that weapon. Uh, you know, we knew that it was Taliban dude on that radio call for fire. You know, we can, we can, we can roll in and we can launch something at them and then they would do a javelin or something at them. And so that was just a regular soldier, like who invented something. And then the bigger military picked it up and Raytheon picked it up, but that dude invented it. And so what inventions are going to happen here is going to be the defining measure. And I think a lot of the militaries need to be looking at that, like getting creative now and figuring out the solutions because those are solutions we're going to pull into the next war and whoever is at the forefront of those solutions is going to have the cutting edge in the next big war which is just around the corner in a selfish way this is a benefit to the united states because we get to watch and see how this war plays out and there's a cost to everything and whether you want to say it's the cost of the aid we're sending over the equipment whatever the economic cost in the world stage mm -hmm. We're not losing cities. We're not losing soldiers. We're not losing civilians. And we're, get, we're, we're we and the rest of the world is learning a lot, um, a lot, yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's, oh. uh, it, it is the closest thing we're going to see, like if we do go head to head against another conventional military. But the fog um, of war, like with the Wolfhound scenario, I mean, the thing, here's the other part of that, you know, they get triangulated and the Taliban learn from that too. So it's not like that that technique works from yeah, here on out forever. forever because he invented a technique. It will work for a period of time, yes. Yes. But then they're going, whatever they, and I'm sure they did figure this out. I don't know what they did to get around it, but um, yeah, it's a real thing. And so it's just constantly yeah. escalating and everybody's changing strategy accordingly and, and trying to figure it out as they go. Yeah, that's the, uh, like the RC car idea. Like one of my buddies brought up the thing, he's like, yeah. It's, it, it would work a couple of times and then they're going to figure it out and then they're going to do it too. And that would be mm -hmm. horrible. And yeah. it's like the, uh, yeah, there, there's, I guess it all depends on like whoever is staying at the very front of innovation is going to be the, the sharpest tool and you know, the sharpest knife. And um, there does have to be a really great investment in to being that innovator, to being that lead. That's the only Gosh, I mean, like if some other country picks uh, the edge up in front of us, what would the world look like? I mean, it's uh, I'm not trying to be patriotic. I'm not trying to be like pro-America here. But if one of these bad actors in the world you know, was leading militarily, then we would have a very dark future ahead of us. And so we, for better or worse, this is as good as it gets right now. And we have to be those innovators. We do have to uh, do a heavy investment. And it, it need to become not just America's problem. It does need to be, Europe does need to step up more. And um, yeah. I was going to say, that's why I think it's actually a bad thing. So I guess I would disagree with you guys. I Because we are expediting uh, more efficient ways of killing. And I would yeah. rather, why can't we, <laughs> the longer we wait to do that, the better. I mean, you. I don't think that's a good thing. World War One what is it? Let me see, uh, like 40 million deaths, right? With technology improvements of warfare. Did that stop World War II? Obviously not with 80 million deaths. They doubled it afterwards. Thinking of that sort of horrendous thing, 
it's not to me it's not an improvement so the fact that these two people are learning how to kill better i'm not a yeah. fan of it no it, it's that's the struggle though isn't it like the whether you like it or not like the enemy is going to the also like, true but, yeah because like it, whether america actually in america wasn't very very big for a while too whenever we got into africa you know we had to learn a lot of hard lessons there mm -hmm. uh, also true uh, against the desert oh, very true. And so the but hitler was determined to be an innovator and they they were good i mean sure. like you know they, they were became excellent bit too too perfectionist on their tanks so they didn't have a fast rollout but the uh but yeah and so like when we're looking at the landscape right now like we have a great edge everybody knows it you know we are the best in town right now um and it, it does create some sort of st stability for better or worse um i wish there was a way I, as a chaplain i wish there was a way that you know i just i, I, I don't know. see it because as long as somebody is evil in the world and tyrannical i know i know i just want to stick my head in the sand and ignore it all you know but you know that that's <laughs> You know, you're a fool for that too. And then if you're like obsessed with what everybody else is doing, you're going to crumble within, right? It's like there's children dying in Ukraine, but tens of millions of children live in poverty right here in the United States with there is yeah. no war. So why can't we solve that problem without having to go against some belligerent that's uh, leveling grid squares? Isn't that an easier short uh, problem to sort of tackle that's more attainable and you know, it, it's just, I don't know the answer to any of these things. That's, the, it's like the, uh, I think I figure out how to do both. And like what I saw, like the, there was a, uh, in the children's hospital, uh, I was hanging out with this three-year-old named Dennis. And uh, the only thing he could really say is I'm Dennis, because that's the only, only English he knew. So he just kept repeating, I'm Dennis. I'm like, hey, Dennis. Um, but uh, he was injured in an uh, artillery attack from the Russians, and his dad was killed. And so his mom's 25, and she has four kids. And 30% um, of the kids who are in those hospitals, their parents can't be found. So it's like there's uh, the way that this war is conducted is so, so different uh, in that it's mass casualties massive amount of civilian casualties and they're targeting civilians i've gone in like school after school after school after hospital after hospital of all these destroyed buildings that the russians were intentionally targeting the civilian targets and it's strange to me like as a soldier like thinking i mean like one on a humanitarian side no way that's evil we don't but two you're utilizing you're using your military resources time energy and effort to do this it's insane it doesn't make sense to me because they're thinking that they're going to just break their will to fight like Hitler tried with the Brits. Mm -hmm. Like what you, he has no, they have not paid attention to history. It just builds their resolve. And, but hmm. for us, uh, we do have to take care of the poverty in America. And we do have a lot of problems in America that we would address. The greatest evil though, always needs to be prioritized. And right now I do think this is the greatest evil that's, that is the world is facing. Great point. I what I've seen, and uh, it's it's breaking my heart in ways I can't fully articulate, even compared to what I saw in Afghanistan. Mm. Um, and I saw a lot of bad stuff there. Yeah, it's like this has been just um, truly, truly evil um, in ways I haven't seen before. And you also, this I know there's a lot of hyperbole, like with the exaggerations from both sides we know this yep. um but then there's a lot that's not exaggerations i mean like mass graves rapes the brutality um and them being ordered to do it um and then come them rolling in with tanks to do it it's mm. like that they got it they can go yeah but so if you got there about six weeks ago that means that the war started while you were in the states so you yeah, were, I'm yeah. sure, reading up on it and, and trying to keep track of it. What, ha or has there been anything that is much different on the ground than what you thought it would have been? Or just, I don't want to say how it's reported, but we definitely, 
it, it's hard to get the entire full picture and understand everything through yeah. a news source here. But was there any big difference when you got on the ground? Um, I'm trying to think of like what I, my, my head is like pivoted so much. Sure. Yeah. The, the, I do think that everything is turned into sound bites and that processing information that way removes humanity uh because humanity cannot be expressed in sound bites it just doesn't because so then people become numbers and then those numbers get thrown out and it just kind of washes over us where then that's that's i i try to do the completely opposite uh, of that on storytelling that's why i do long form because it just can't be compressed actually i, I met a uh, war reporter who had a breakdown over that uh he just got tired of doing the sound bites and uh, so he left, he was reporting in Bosnia and he left the news business for a, a decade just because it, it just broke him. Sure. And then he's like decided that he wanted to come back out here. A Spanish reporter, really good dude. They decided to come back out here to try to report the news again and try to give it a second shot. But the, the, the medium still requires that, that constraint. And so I even saw that struggle on him as he was reporting the news. I'm doing a, a, a short documentary on war reporters because when I was out there, I'm not a war reporter. I'm a, I'm a soldier who became a filmmaker. I thought it was the strangest crew of people. So I decided I would go ahead and film. I had two days. I was like, tell the producer, give me two days. I'm going to get this story. I'm going to go out with them to some of these bad places and I'll put this together. So that's what I did. And uh, so I see that, that issue that we are not getting. We do need to figure out how to articulate the humanity more, um, how to take longer to have these conversations and figure out a way that you know, it can still be expressed, which is harder because social media and the, the medium that people are digesting are picking up pace from like YouTube to TikTok. Yeah. It now has to move so fast, but so much is said and so little is being processed. Um, we've got to figure out how to exist in all those areas, um, but figure out how to also express the, the deeper stories that are going on so that way true understanding can be achieved. I think I saw something recent. I can't remember if it was half a second or seven seconds. I know there's a big difference there, but the time you have to, maybe it was half a second on TikTok is the time that you have to get somebody's attention for them to watch the video. You're not yeah. getting anything out in half a second, right? And even yeah. if it is seven seconds, you're not getting anything but a soundbite out um, when really you can't even get an intro out in seven seconds. So yeah. it's interesting to think about that because I don't even think it's malicious in a sense. No. Um, it's not intentionally misleading news all of the time. It's, it's, there's not space for it. There's not space for this nuanced conversation. Yeah. And it's, uh, I'm like the way I'm approaching, you know, even the film stuff now it's, and just as a, a content creator in the way that we're designing it, of course, I'm building up like a big team to kind of put all these pieces together, people smarter than myself, you know, to, to do that. But I have to exist on TikTok. I have to exist on YouTube. I have to exist uh, on television and in film, and and even in like the podcast realm. At some point, you know, I'll start entering into. The, we've been toying with that stuff, but there's not a place where I can't be if I'm to fully launch the longer conversations, because I have to pull that audience up to those things to to get them. Because if they exist over here then they're not going to have this conversation with me. And this is not um, a career move or an entertainment strategy. This is a tax for me to make a difference. I have to do this for me to have the social impact I want to have. I have to do this. And with my content, like with do good, the idea is that, you know, we donate the monetization of views of the social media, but then we're trying to partner with bigger partners to have that deeper impact on you know the stuff that we're trying to achieve it's it i think we're all all of us are kind of involved in that and it's it is something that's hard to wrap the brain around you know because culture is shifting and it is becoming faster but um and i, I don't want to be like an older person like saying you know like judging the future generations because i don't think that's necessarily the thing that they are becoming more efficient and they want to cut to the chase, but then that longer conversation of what's really going on, it can get lost. Yeah. 
Well, it's it's sort of a double edged sword, too, because let's go back to the World War Two era. You know, there wasn't the ability because what you have right now, a TikTok or this is the ability to report from on the ground without the New York Times backing you, which needs special privileges from the United States government that sort of screens what goes out. And yes. so while it's instantaneous and, and it can get the first snippet of whatever intelligence t tends to not be true, right? It tends to be exaggeration yes. or there's just obviously underlying context to your guys' yes. point for good, not intentional. It's just sort of the fog of war scenario. But yes. yeah. nowadays we have the capacity for really anybody with a plane ticket and a, and, and a little um, wallet sized device to be able to report from the trench. And I just wonder, yes. again, we'll never know, but like World War II, if you, let's say, as a World War One veteran, were doing the same thing, would that number and many more of you, would that 80 million casualty number be 60 million instead? Would it have been 100 million? You know, I, I don't yeah. know. But I kind of like the premise and the phrase sunlight is the best disinfectant. And yeah. that's sort of my faith in this social media stuff that we're figuring it out. And I know that we're just hairless apes and, and dopamine and those sort of things that are yeah. addicting to us. But I also like that, you know, what you're doing and you are telling the human, I think we're, what we're talking about is fighting dehumanization, uh, yes. basically yes. in all sort of forms of it. And because yes. we know the nastiness and we know that I've probably, I felt it myself had to fight that struggle with my own mm -hmm. self fighting other human beings. And yeah. it's easy to, to want to hate the enemy and, and cause your job yeah. is to kill them. And then especially yeah. if you're in a leadership role, it's to be in their ear saying, kill, 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 move forward, kill. Yeah. Um, that's what a platoon leader does. They're pushing the, for the ferocity of the team yes. leader and the squad leader. Um, and it's just such a tricky, tricky, tricky waters to sort of navigate. Well, and it's like the, the landscape of the battle too, I think has changed so much on, um, you know, there's a really good book out right now called Three Dangerous Men. And I, I'm trying to think of the author's name, but it's essentially, it's about Russia, Iran, and China and disinformation and how much, I mean, we are behind them in many, many ways because we, they saw that they couldn't win the conventional fight. And also, if they did win the conventional fight, what does that mean? We're all dead. So mm -hmm. it's like, you're not going to win this game. And if you do win this game, everybody's gone. So is that a game you really want to play? Mm -hmm. do, you want, do you want to invest in that game? Because they're going to out-invest you in Russia. Tried to play that game of out-investing us, and they lost. So, okay, so that's not going to work. Well, what will work? Well, we can invest in propaganda. And we can still achieve what we want to achieve strategically by just pivoting, you know, to, to these other strategies in, in irregular warfare. And so irregular warfare for Russia just ramped up and they invested heavy investments and got heavily involved in our political systems and our social systems and creating a division, trying to pull the U.S. away from Europe and our allies. And they were successful in that. And the same thing with Britain. That was part of their objectives. I'm trying to think of like that Russian philosopher that Putin was listening to. It's Russia's Rasputin, you know, basically outlining that agenda needs to happen. Those those uh, objectives boxes were checked. They got to go. They did a good job. Plunged mm. away. But now, even China and also Iran are, are are some bad players in all this too. So we have the conventional side. We, we know we're doing good there. Now the question is, is how are we doing when it comes to regular warfare? And do we really want to do propaganda like they've been doing? You know, is that because what happens is once you tell a lie and then people found out they lied, people won't trust you. Right. And it's, uh, apologize. It, it, it creates, it's kind of, you've seen that with, you know, Ukraine. It's like, if something comes out, then it, oh, it's not quite true. Then you're going to be less likely to believe the next thing. So a better strategy is to point out the lies of the enemy, point out when they are pushing out misinformation, but there's going to have to be a heavy amount of investment in showing these manipulations. And the U.S. is actually farther behind in doing this and we've suffered the consequences of that within our own and the madness that spun up um, a lot of these have been russian 
you know, projects and they're good. They're really good. You know, they're great miss at, at doing the propaganda and manipulating our systems. But the, um, I think that's going to be the new area of advancement. And the problem is, is like, it's hard for generals to sometimes wrap their minds around it because an admiral wants a battleship. You know, he trained his entire life and dreamed of someday commanding a battleship. He doesn't want to command a, a, a group of you know, <laughs> internet people. But that's the new, the changing landscape of warfare is going to be misinformation or, you know, accurate, you know, sh dis uh, counter propaganda. Yeah. So that, that raises no, a question I had. I've seen that here too. Yeah. Well, with what you're doing, there's no, with, with, with no greater love and with the racing documentary, there's a very clear end. You knew when you were coming home from Afghanistan, generally. When the race was over, yeah. the documentary was probably on or about over. But, but how are you going to draw that line here? Um, when are you, when is enough enough to where you can, you can step oh, back? I'm going to ask my wife, <laughs> ask the boss, yeah. wife and kids. Yeah. The, um, it's there, there's like clear objectives that we're trying to achieve on the social side and, um, basically trying to, the, the concept of do good is it's a storytelling machine that does good for those who do good. And so, you know, I, it's approaching it as a filmmaker, but also as a chaplain, like that when we see that, and it is kind of like we're in a lab, we're experimenting with things, seeing what works and what doesn't, but yeah, this is really kind of our, our launch off point in a, a bigger way. So we'll probably about two months, hopefully, but if things escalate, then, you know, in, in a different way, if something goes south, if nukes get launched or something like that, then this is going to be a changing project. And um, at the end of the day, I have to go where it is the worst. And so, and then try to articulate those stories because that will change the film and the film won't be done then. Um, but my hope is that that does not happen because um, mm -hmm. I don't want my team that way. <laughs> I'm kind of in the bad places for that. Uh, so the, the hope is that sanity is kept on the Russian side and, um, as he says that about news, Alex, he cuts out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, Hey, I cut out. Yeah, you're, you're talking talking about nukes and then you go silent and I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking up uh, chaplains in heaven. Uh, but no, man, it's, uh, yeah, it's, if, if things do go south, then I have to adapt. Um, but I do think sanity is going to be kept on the Russian side. I don't think that they're suicidal. And so, uh, uh, where um, I, I just don't see it. Uh, so good, better weapons are being pushed forward. Ukraine has higher morale, and that is impacting the fight. Uh, they are very high morale at the front, is what I saw, and not not even like a negativity, just like a positive energy with all of them, and um, yeah, great brotherhood, great fellowship at the front too. So they they were great cohesion. Uh, they're working together really well. And based off of what I'm hearing from Russia, I, I, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but if Russia is not approaching them with that same kind of Super Bowl attitude, yeah, then they're not going to win it. Right. So I, I foresee two or three more months for me, and then I'll have to make decisions as we get closer. But I know at least two or three more months to cover the humanitarian stories. I mean, do you feel like you're living a dream, not the dream, but a dream with – the stuff that you've seen and done, I just, the experiences in your I don't know, man. brain. It's like, a, it, it is, it's, it's weird, right? Like the, uh, like when, when I, when I was being raised, I'm, I'm the son of a drug dealer, you know, very violent home, went to seminary, went to the military, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's been weird chapters in my life. And, um, uh, I've seen what God has done, you know, throughout everything. That's why I'm, I'm dappling. I mean, that's why, you know, I have faith. It's like, I see God working in all these things. 
and I, I see the story playing out and I see uh, this ability that we, if we do change the way we approach some things, we can try to make a bigger difference. The whole goal in the Duga idea is to try to use storytelling to start putting a better spotlight on these issues. So I do see those things coming together and, and I don't know, like with every, all the hard stuff, I'm just grateful. Um, it has been a blessing and it has been good. So, uh, yeah. And it's like, y'all know like what it's like in, in warfare. I mean, like this is, this has been kind of different. Like, you know, it's bad. It sucks. Um, and then there's some awful stuff that just breaks your heart and breaks your soul. Um, but then there's just the most amazing things, those amazing, truly amazing human beings who are stepping up. And I think the, the light breaks away the darkness and it just, I don't know, it gives you so much hope. Um, so that's what it's been for me. I mean, I've, I've, I've been so truly moved by the Ukrainian people and the soldiers that have stepped up and the end the human beings, the civilians, uh, the differences they're making. I. I came in being open to changing my opinion on Ukraine when I first came here because I didn't want to, because I know that the, there was so pro Ukraine in the media. I was like, well, I'm going to go over there and I want to just kind of see it for myself. Yeah, and sure. um, after they're like us, honestly, different language, but same kind of attitudes, same kind of view on democracy. They don't want to submit. They don't want to go back to slavery and they view it as slavery the occupation of russia and communism they viewed that as a slavery they, now that they've tasted freedom they will they would rather die than go back and so and they look at you know crimea and all of that land as theirs so we have an ongoing conflict even after we get past the donbass bulge this battle of bulge there's still more and so we'll see how it goes well it's yeah. um it's really important. I don't need to tell you that, but it's what you're doing is really important. But I am proud that it's a U.S. Army veteran and somebody from 101st. Like I feel, I feel, oh, that feels. Yeah, bad. man. I'm going to brag about that. Um, this <laughs> little connection. I'm going to brag about that. Um, but but what can what can we the listeners do to find you to support you to keep up with what your team is doing there? Um, I mean, it's we. It's, it's so weird because like, you know, I've been doing like a little bit of TikTok and things like that. And I'm just now learning. I'm like, I feel like an old man, honestly, like doing a TikTok like mm -hmm. the, uh, but um, our, our teams and systems are just now coming, coming to play. And so like once we actually do the official launches, that's when we're going to be looking for a lot of love to get the messages out. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, like do good is not the thing. You know, we don't want donations to do good. The whole point is the people that we're putting a spotlight on, the people who are in the trenches making a difference. And so that's what we want to broadcast out. That's that's when we're going to be begging for love because this guy over here or that gal over there, there's, there's a gal with World Kitchen who is running to the front lines to feed people every day. And I'm like, that's the most amazing human being. Um, so that's who we're going to be just calling out for support on. Yeah, and we definitely love it. Well, you're talking to the TikTok professional here, so I'm sure he's I know, got some tips man. for you. I've because been watching him. He doesn't even talking, know. Like, he's on yeah. my phone every yeah, day. I mean, we're talking about, like, you need 0.5 seconds to get someone's attention. And, it, you know, it, it, and that's not what he's doing. You know, it's, he's not doing that. He's telling stories yes. that are real, that are context driven, that are yes. not booty shaken, attention grabbing, sensationalized headlines. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, yeah. yeah. Not yet. Maybe well, booty shaking late, but you got to get you to a million. But, but so we might, you that, might have to do something there to get to that point. His, his, vo his voice moderation doesn't change. Like it stays calm and he's explaining it, but it's, it's a fast medium. It's calm. I think exactly. that that does help because like you know, all these people are like hold on boy don't go anywhere to kind of you know, they they start you know getting at you and you're like oh click get away and so <laughs> it's your yeah your, your approach is but I I realized I was uh, an old veteran when all of my content started to become a lot of military history 
and kind of like all this, you know, yeah, it's like the, the algorithm figured me out really quickly. Like Pretty I love military history. So that's, that's, that's why I was like, man, hey, he's doing a great job. I'm digging it. And uh, when he ever started talking about the Ukraine stuff, I was like, ah, yeah. And then I found out you were a hundred first guy. I was like, oh man, yeah. that's like a uh, all yeah. the check mark. Yeah. Well, yes. genu genuinely, Justin, if there's anything I can do, say or and I can do war stories, please don't hesitate. Um, we'd love to help. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent, man. Hundred percent. But yeah, thanks so much for coming on. We'll let you get back to the real work um, being done out there, and, and hope to stay in touch. Roger that. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll see you.